The Lord has come, Lord, with a burden on their heart and on their mind. And only you, Lord, you can lift that burden. So speak to our hearts. And let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, let everyone say, Amen. And Amen. Thank the Lord because um, God is so good. He's good all the time, both in good times and in bad times. Amen? Amen. I will bless the Lord Amen. at all times. Yes, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. The hardest thing to do sometimes is to bless the Lord when you're going through something. Am I right? Yes. It's easy to bless the Lord and praise the Lord when it's nothing but sunny days. But if you live long enough, you're going to have some dark days. Am I right? Amen. You live long enough, there's going to be some times when you're almost wanting to throw in the towel because of the terrible tragedies that seem to be coming your way. Just And if you haven't experienced it yet, you will experience it. Amen. Or else you're not human. Because even Jesus said, in this world, you are going to have tribulation. But be a good cheer because I've overcome the world. You see, it's not about actually the tribulation that you go through. It's the person who's going through the tribulation. If you're going through it by yourself, then you're not going to make it. But if you go through your tribulation with Christ Jesus, you can make it through any trial. Amen? Amen. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles to the book of 1 Thessalonians, the 5th chapter. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to look at verse number 1. And go through verse number 8. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verses 1 through verse number 8. Say amen. Amen. If you're there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. We're going to go through verse 8. I'm going to ask you to stand as we read the word of God together. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Verse 1. And continuing through verse number 8, the Word of God says, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then such destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a what? Thief. Ye are all children of the what? Light. And the children of the what? Thief. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the what? In the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. Let's continue. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain sal excuse, salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we live whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. You all may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I'll be the first to say I love Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, I love Dr. King. His speeches, his bearing, his eloquence and elegance, the gravity and maturity with which he carried himself has probably been rivaled by but very few others living in this generation. I mean, I'm 41 years old. I'm, I'm 41 years old. And, but when I listen to him speak, his maturity and bearings dwarf mine. And yet the guy only lived to be 39 years old. In fact, consider this. And consider this. By the time he lost his life at the hands of an assassin's bullet, 
King had probably already accomplished more than most people will accomplish in many lifetimes. See, he led out in the dismantling of the segregated busing system of the South. He, he was instrumental in the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that helped to make sure that blacks and other minorities were no longer giving any, given any roadblocks at the ballot box. And I need to actually pause here and say, if you're not voting, shame on you. With the help of others, he broke down the walls of Jim Crow segregation and usher, ushered in an age of integration and freedom for people who had been relegated to second-class citizenship for over 100 years. And he was able to see the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which they, they expanded on immediately after his death that essentially uh, made discrimination illegal. So as I said before, I love... Dr. King never met the man, never met the man. I never got a chance to see the man. In fact, he died before I was ever even born. But the legacy he left still seems to loom. The shadows of the legacy that he left still seems to loom over America. And I thank God for that shadow. Matter of fact, I can remember as a child, I used to go to church with my dad every Dr. King holiday. Now, I'm, I, that's why I'm kind of surprised. All we have is a parade here. I'm just going to be honest. I mean, it's great to have a parade, but I'm used to a church service. Anybody else used to church services on Dr. King's house? They'd have a church service. I, know, I used to go to, it's called the Lampkin Baptist Church. My wife went there with me, not for Dr. King, but they had a youth federation there. And the, the pastor of the church was still living. It was a very, very animated God. But they would have some of the greatest preachers. And they would preach these powerful sermons on Dr. King's holiday. And they'd actually, they, they would actually recount some of the actual advances that they had made, actually, as a result of the, of the accomplishments that he had done in his life. And then after we had have service, then we'd go home, and I remember we would actually watch some TV programs on the Civil Rights Movement, and on the marches, and on, 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 the, on the Freedom Rides, and on those sit-ins, and some of those other different things. It was always a wonderful time for me, and, 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 and friends, I always, in fact, I'll be honest, he was one of the first people who actually impressed me with the desire to be a, a preacher. Amen. Weirdest thing, I actually wanted to be a Dr. Mar another Dr. King. And, I, and, what, and this is going to sound crazy to y'all. I actually wanted to almost be a martyr. I wanted to almost be a martyr. I, I, you know, it's weird because it's almost like I wanted to be a martyr after accomplishing something great. Then I die. I actually, I'm just taken off the scene. You know, it's always good to actually end on a high. <laughs> but in the life of this great man, and I think in the life of every great man of God, there seems to be a penultimate a moment of triumph that they can look back to. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I think if Noah was alive today, he would look back at the time when God delivered him uh, from the flood with his family. I think if Moses was alive today, he, oh, excuse me, if, if Moses was down here from heaven, he would probably recount the time when God was actually with them as they were standing there in the Red Sea and the, and the Egypt, Egyptians were behind them and they had a sea in front of them and they didn't know exactly which way to turn. And, and God parted the Red Sea and actually dried up the mud and the base of the sea so that they were able to walk over on dry ground. I think if Joshua were to look back, I think Joshua would recount the time when God actually told them to walk around the walls of Jericho seven times. And then on that seventh day, you remember actually they were to walk around it seven times on that one day. And then they were to shout and God brought the walls tumbling down. Or better yet, he probably remember the time when God, when he told the sun, sun, stand still. Hallelujah. And the son listening to the voice of this man, and at the same time the voice of God had to stay in place long enough for God to give them deliverance. I think, friends, I think if David were to actually look back over his life, he'd probably remember the time when he was standing before Goliath. And this looming giant, nine feet tall, stood before him with a sword and with a spear with a shield. He said, you come to me with a, a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Hallelujah. And with nothing but a slingshot, he swung it round and round, and, and the Holy Spirit guided that rock right to his forehead, and the giant came tumbling down. I thank friends. If Solomon were to look back over his life, he will remember the time when actually God used him to build that huge temple, and they dedicated the temple, and the glory of God came down 
on the temple to the point where the priest had to leave the temple. I think if Elijah would look back over his life, he would talk about when he was up there on Mount Carmel. Come on now. There was the 400 prophets of Baal, and he was standing there all by himself. And he said, why haunt ye between two opinions? And even with nothing but a, but a simple prayer, God brought fire down from, from heaven, consumed his sacrifice, and all that was left was nothing. I think if Dr. King would have looked back over his life, oh, he could remember... The Voting Rights Act. He could probably remember the, uh, the, the, the march from Selma to Montgomery. But I think there was one incident that he recalled above all the others. And that would probably be on August the 28th, 1963. When he stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in front of some 250,000 people. And he told them... He, and it's interesting because the history records that he had a prepared speech. He'd written it down and, and he was actually going through his prepared speech when all of a sudden he was interrupted by the words of Mahalia Jackson saying, Martin, tell him about the dream that you had. And all of a sudden he, he moved away from the speech and he began to ride, ride the wave of the Holy Ghost. Come on now. And as he began to ride the wave of the Holy Ghost, friends, God began to speak words to him saying, I have a dream that one day little black boys and little black girls will be able to join hands with little black white boys and white girls in a wonderful, uh, wonderful symphony of, uh, of brotherhood. I have a dream. That one of these days, men will not be judged by the, by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today, friends. I have a dream that every mountain shall be brought low, and every valley shall be exalted. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places plain, and the, and, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. I have a dream today, friends. And friends, it was so powerful until literally that huge congregation went from that being nothing but a civil rights movement to being a congregation or a church service. Yes, and people began to shout, friends, yes. as they felt the moving of the power of the Holy Ghost, friends, yes. to the point that the president himself mm. had to actually sit up and listen to what Dr. King was saying. Yes. Because when God speaks, yes. everybody has to listen, friends. Yes. When God's moving... Everybody has to stand still. I, I, I believe the power of God was upon that man, friends. And it's interesting because his prophecy came true. We live in a church. We're in a church right now. And the church is actually, it's not just black folks. There's some Caucasians in here. Amen? There's a, there's a Hispanic in here. Amen? We don't just go to a, a school that's actually segregated anymore. There's no longer a such thing as segregated hotels and segregated restaurants and segregated employment. Praise God, we actually have seen Dr. King's dreams come true. I praise God for it. But at the same time, at the same time as his, as his prophecies came true, the sad reality is is that I don't have a dream. I don't have a dream. I have a nightmare. I have a nightmare. Or I'm having nightmares. Because the sad reality is is that even though his prophecies came true, the sad reality is is that that's not the end of the story. In fact, Paul actually said it a whole lot better than I did right here in our text, 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. And essentially what he was saying is, is that I really don't have to tell you about these measured times. Or, 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 you know, I don't have to tell you about prophecy. Why? Because you should already know that. Why? Because you should be students of the prophecies of Scripture. You ought to be students of the Word. You ought to know what's about to take place on this planet, friends. For you yourselves, verse 2, you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, you know, these Adventist preachers, we always like to emphasize the part about thief in the night, meaning that it's not, it's not talking about a secret rapture, but what it's talking about is the fact that when he comes, most of the world will not be expecting him. In fact, Revelation chapter 1, go with me to look at Revelation, the first chapter, verse number 7. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 7. 
Look what Revelation 1 verse 7 says. And friends, it's, it's true that there's no such thing as a secret rapture. It's not a secret. The Bible says that when he comes, behold, how many eyes shall see him? He cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. What it's essentially saying is, is that because he's going to come so unexpectedly, friends, most of the world will not be prepared. And that's why they're going to be wailing. And, and, and sign is because they know they're not ready for the coming of Jesus. Which, by the way, I need to ask you, are you ready for the coming of Jesus? Because he's coming very soon. Amen. We always like to emphasize that part. And we ought to emphasize that part. But there's another part to that scripture that you may not have seen. It says, behold, he comes as a thief in the what? Night. And when you think of night, when I think about night, I think of darkness. In fact, go with me, you're about to look at the book of Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. What the Bible is essentially saying is, is that when Jesus comes, he's going to be coming in a certain time in this world's history, unlike any other. Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 and verse number 2. Isaiah 60, verse 1 and 2. You all ought to take notes. Write this stuff down. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1 and verse number 2. Say amen if you're there. Arise. Shine, for thy light is what? Come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Listen to verse 2. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be a what? Seen upon thee. Which means, friends, that when Jesus comes, this world is going to be in midnight darkness, unlike any other time in this world's history, friends, before the coming of Jesus, is going to be un it's going to be darker than any other time you and I have ever seen. When Jesus comes, instead of us having an upswing towards brotherhood, it's going to be a downswing towards towards conflict, wars, no peace, and essentially destruction. In fact, Peter went on to describe it himself when he said, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman and with child, and they shall not what? Are you all with me? They shall not escape. For those who studied history, there was a man by the name of Neville Chamberlain. Anybody ever heard of Neville Chamberlain? Never Chamberlain in the year 1938, October of 1938, he went to Germany as he saw Hitler rumbling, Hitler getting stronger and stronger. He went to Munich, Germany to actually sign what was known as a peace accord with Germany. He was known as a peaceman. And when he went there, he actually signed this accord with Germany saying, okay, you can take the Sudeten lands of Czechoslovakia because those are German peoples. You can go ahead and take them, but that's where you're going to stop. And he thought that as a result of this, he thought there was not going to be anything else that was done by Hitler. In fact, when he went back to Britain, and actually he was, he was met by these adoring crowds. This was in the year 1938. October 1938. And he said something interesting. I want you to hear what he said. He said, my good friends, talking to the crowds in England, my good friends, this is the second time there has come back from Germany to Downing Street peace with honor. I believe it is peace for our time. We, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Now, I re now listen to what he said. Now I recommend you go home and sleep quietly in your bed. Because in his mind, he thought that the peace accord that he had signed with Hitler was going to last forever. What he didn't realize is not too long after he signed it, he was, that Hitler, not too long after he signed this peace accord, he was actually a talk, he was approached by one of his officers, and the officer was mad that he'd signed this peace accord, and Hitler essentially said to him, he said, listen to what he said, he said, oh, don't take it so seriously. That piece of paper is of no further significance whatever. He said, I'm not even taking it seriously. That was simply to fool Great Britain. And within 11 months, Hitler engaged in what was known as the Blitzkrieg, in which he took over Poland. 
and World War II began in which 50 million people lost their lives. When they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes. Fast forward, fast forward, fast forward. I was, uh, I've talked about this before. I was sitting in the waiting room of the hospital. I can't remember. I think it was Baptist Hospital East, Louisville, Kentucky. I'd gotten a phone call from my grandfather saying, you need to come home. Your, your grandmother's sick. Your grandmother, excuse me, my mom, my, my mom was sick. She was, she was dying from breast cancer. So I drove in my car from Huntsville, Alabama, Oakwood University, Oakwood College at the time. I drove home. And I remember I got there to the hospital. My mom's on a respirator. She only had seven more days to live. And I remember instead of going home, we would spend the night in the waiting room. And we spent, spent the night in the, rain, in the waiting room that Monday night. Woke up that morning to the news. And as we were watching the news, I think it was uh, Katie Couric and Brian Montgomery. Montgomery. They said, we're sad to announce that there was a terrible accident. Some plane had run into one of the World Trade Center towers. And I thought it was just nothing but a terrible accident. I'm sure some of you all thought the exact same thing 18 and a half years ago. And as we were watching on national television, they were talking about how the building was on fire. It was burning. And you could see, the, you could see some of the ashes that actually were falling from the building. We watched in horror as a second plane rammed into that second tower and we recognized this was no accident at all. And I remember my brother so vividly telling me, he was saying, I wouldn't be surprised if this is nothing but a decoy for them that didn't run into the Pentagon. And within just a short time, another plane rammed into the Pentagon. And not too much longer after that, a fourth plane ran aground in Pennsylvania. Perhaps it was headed towards the White House. And our nation, a nation that had basked in it being the only superpower left, a nation that bragged about the fact that we had more military might than any other nation in the world. Not only were, they, not only were they, we the most powerful military power, we, we were the most powerful economic power, the most powerful financial power. We realized that we were not as powerful as we thought. This nation was at war. I remember they actually grounded all the planes. They would not allow any plane to move because they recognized that we were not as safe as we thought we were. Fast forward seven years. Fast forward seven years. 2007, 2008. A subprime mortgage crisis. You know what they said? They said between the year 2007 and 2008, Americans lost a third of their net worth. And they say the equity, the total equity that people had in their homes. At, in 2006, it was $13 trillion. Here we know. By 2008, by 2008, the equity that people had in their homes went from $13 trillion to $8 trillion. They lost $5 trillion in equity. Meaning that homes that you, could, you initially had to buy maybe for $200,000 by 2008, they literally probably may have gone down to under a hundred thousand dollars. In fact, with the with all these big businesses and banks going under, it literally got to the point where America was literally at the edge of going back over into another Great Depression. When they say unto you peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh as travail 
upon a woman. You, you know, when I, when, I, when I read that part where it says, as travail upon a woman, it's almost like Paul was repeating the words of Jesus. Go with me to Matthew chapter 24. It's almost like Paul was repeating the words of Jesus in Matthew, the 24th chapter. And when, when his disciples were talking and 